Hey, good afternoon. Welcome back to Phantom Works. It is Friday. It is almost Friday. Um, we're on Friday Eve, and um, I, I wanted to, to sort of follow a thread because I get a lot of requests for doing full restorations on cars for really, really low amounts of money, and, and I, I keep wondering where these people come up with their math because I don't even understand it at all. So uh, Brigitte, who is actually the producer of uh, this, this production that we're on, and, and she didn't understand it either, and I said, Brigitte, can you do some research for me and figure out why they're all asking me to do ridiculously low-priced restorations, like $25,000 all in, parts, labor, LS engines, wheels, tires, paint jobs, everything else. So, um, and by the way, I learned never go anywhere and have a discussion without bringing your whiteboard. So we're gonna go in and see Brigitte, if you wouldn't mind following me. Um, and we're going to see what Brigitte has to say, because um, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get to the bottom of this. Hey, Brigitte. All right, so... Um, you brought the camera crew with you? I, I brought the crew. So this is Brigitte. All right, and, and, and we, we gave her a lesson in how to work with the camera, because she doesn't know this <laughs> side of the camera at all. Um, so, Brigitte, um, I asked you to do some research. How many companies did you find advertising the price of uh, restorations of classic cars? So, I found seven, just the first seven on Google that said forty to 60000 Like, in For their write-up on the search engine. So, so they, they just come out and say a full restoration. And, and can I assume that this is like muscle car era stuff? Yeah. I even, Obviously I, not Ferraris. No, I went and read it and they even said, if you get it done by a professional, it should oh. only cost $60,000. Okay. So forty to $60,000 for a professional restoration. Now, be honest with me. Forget everything you know about Phantom Works. The day before you got here, if someone had told you it would cost forty to sixty thousand to completely make over an old car, would you have thought that was a great deal or a lot of money? I would have thought that was a lot of money. That's a lot of money. It yeah. seems like like how can it possibly cost forty thousand dollars to restore a car, right? Right. I mean, it seems crazy, but. We're gonna have a little fun. Oh, wait a second. Did you find anything outside of the 40 to 60 range? I did. I found one site that said it could be anywhere from 50 to 100,000, and in like rare instances, maybe 250,000. So, so one site actually admitted that they run 50 to 100, mm -hmm. but in rare instances, $250,000. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna have a little bit of fun. Now, I sent you a presentation. And, and, and so I, I did, in fact, set this up. I just wrote this 10 minutes ago and sent it to her. So she hasn't gone through it. I'm, I'm, um, I got to find it. You got it. All right. So, so while she tries to figure it out, the reason I'm doing this, folks, is because there has to be some logic applied to, to getting a car restored. And, and one of the examples I use is Timex and Rolex. Ironically, the names are very similar. Looking at two watches from 20 feet away, a Timex and a Rolex look very similar. Yet there's an unbelievable difference in the price between a Timex and a Rolex. So we're gonna go through a few interesting things. The body shop, uh, flat rate for labor. So I was in at a dealership just a little while ago doing something, and I saw on the wall they had an advertised rate of $58, and I thought, how can anyone sell labor in, in this time and age for $58? I can barely get an employee for 58 bucks an hour. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, well, here's the first part that they didn't say, that when I went up and asked the manager of the body shop, how can they do it? He goes, well, we also charge a material flat rate. And I said, okay, what does that mean? He said, well, for every hour we work on the car, we charge not only a labor rate, we charge a material rate. And I said, okay. And he said, well, that's for tape and primers and fillers and all those things that you use to do a car, right? Things that nobody cares about. Gloves. But gloves, they're important, all right? So, so get me the next slide. So, so it turns out that the advertised rate of 58 was part of it. The other 48 an hour brings you to $106 an hour. But still I'm looking at it saying, Okay, $160, $106 an hour is not bad. It, it actually seems pretty good, and that's for everything, right? Right. No, it's not. So next slide, please. I, I, I couldn't understand how they were actually charging this little, and yet how the bills 
added up to so much. And, and that's when I did some interesting research. So go to the next slide, please. I asked a question because it didn't make sense to me. I asked the shop, how many minutes are in an hour? And the answer was, it depends. Now, Bridgette, in your world, how many minutes are in an hour? Um, 60. 60. All right, camera girl, how many minutes are in an hour? Lady. Uh, 60. 60. If you didn't hear her, she said 62. I thought the same thing. We're all dead wrong. A flat rate hour is based on a technician's skill. So it became very interesting because if they can do a one hour job in only half an hour, they still get to charge you for an hour. Well, I would say, okay, if they can do a half hour, an, a one hour job truly in half an hour, then, then that's not a bad deal. But it gets way worse than that. Please go to the next slide. I walked around to shops. Actually, I drove around, I, I didn't walk. I drove around to many different shops and I called different shops and, and, and they won't admit this straight out, but I started asking them once I got to know them a little bit. So how many hours can you guys turn in a day? How many hours can you guys turn in a week? And we started doing the math. The range for hours is that the shops are averaging billing a new hour or billing 2.3 hours every 60 minutes up to 5.1 hours every 60 minutes. So in other words, the average is somewhere between those two at somewhere around four hours per hour. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. In fact, I don't criminal. think it should be legal. Yeah, it's but criminal. you know what's interesting? It is completely legal to do this because it's based on tables that are accepted and the government apparently signed off on this. So what that means is if you take, and I'm gonna do the minimum and the maximum, if somebody's charging $106 an hour for the all-in body work, and you multiply it by 2.3, that means they're actually charging $243.80 for every 60 minutes they're working. If you- yeah. You have a mic on, you don't have to yell. I like yelling. But you clip when you yell. Okay, so I will stop yelling. But this stuff excites me <laughs> because I am confronted with people looking for, for ridiculously stupid prices all the time. Like that $20,000 one? Oh, I, I can't even tell you how many $20,000 restorations we've been told to do. So here, if you go to the most extreme case I found, and by the way, this wasn't a shop that told me that they get 5.1 hours per hour like they did it once. They said this is their average every week for every employee for years. They're averaging every employee is turning in a 40 hour week, 200 plus hours. No matter their skill level. Doesn't matter. Wow. They're turning 200 hours per employee per week. So that means they're actually billing at $540 for every hour they're actually working on your car. Now in my world, you better be a brain surgeon and a darn good one to earn $540 an hour. All right. And, and what's interesting is while they're charging these rates, their sign says on it, 58 bucks an hour. I don't know how you feel about that, but I don't feel good about it. So next slide. That's why I just spent $200 on an oil change. There you, oh, um, it is not uncommon. I've seen lots and lots of $1,100 oil changes. And, and I mean, we're not talking for Bugattis and, and $10 million Ferraris. We're talking for cars that many people listening will own. All right, so then we get to the materials rate. This one isn't quite as crazy as the labor rate, but most shops upcharge parts a flat 100%. In fact, when I went to get my wife's BMW at one point serviced, they gave me a, they, they said it would be 700 and some dollars and I looked into it. The part that they billed us about $500 for, their cost was actually $146. So they actually, upcharged it by 200%. So, you know, it's crazy. If, if they buy an alternator, this is just one example, for $59, they're selling at 118. And, and for what it's worth, I understand 100% markup, we're nowhere near that. We charge basically, we, we add one more third to the price instead of doubling the price. Um, this, is, this is the industry standard is 100%. I just, that, that's kind of normal. So. I think we're going to about the last slide because then we're gonna have some fun. All right, so 
The average restoration, this is just sort of a, if you slice the pie on materials and labor, you're gonna find that about one third of the cost is materials and roughly two thirds is labor. That's a ballpark and they, they vary. Right? If you buy a lot of expensive parts, usually the labor is a little lower percentage. If you're restoring a lot of parts, the labor will be a higher percentage. So, so the, the industry average to get to 100% is one third, two thirds. So, so you said, I'm going to fill in this now. Now this is where I, I, get, I get to play with my whiteboard. You said the average cost. So, so I'm going to pick, if you were a consumer looking at that, and they said 42 60. to 60. What number would be floating in your head is going to be the cost of that restoration? 40. Actually, I was, I was you are correct. The consumer will always go to the small end. Yep. So, so I'm going to do it for just slightly easier math. I'm going to up you and go to $45,000. So let's go to the formula. Out of $45,000, if, 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 if I'm going to do a restoration from you, for you, and, and one third is going to be parts. How much are we going to spend on parts? Fifteen. $15,000. See why I made it 45? I didn't <laughs> want to do math with $40,000. How much is labor? Um, 30. 30. 000. All right. So, so let's just say that they have a low markup like we do. How much are they going to spend to sell you parts for 15 grand? Just ballpark, just a, a ballpark average. There is. 5,000? That's gonna be more than that. It's gonna be like around $11,000, okay? okay. So, so if you take about, if you back about a, a, a third out of this, you're gonna grant 11,000 is their cost. So they're gonna make about three or 4,000 on all their parts. But remember, they have to have employees and logging and all that. So it's not profit by any means. 30,000 on labor. So if we started doing math at $500 an hour, you can see how little hours you'd get, right? Yeah. So I'm going to make the math ridiculously easy uh -huh. and say we're only going to charge $100 an hour for labor. And by the way, claims of lower than $100 an hour are generally false. Um, a, a man called me up and just recently and said they were only charging him $52 an hour. And I said, that's insane. How can they charge you $52 an hour, pay for electricity, insurance, and employee? And then he explained to me all they had done was a car with no rust on it that they didn't even blast. They had scuffed it and shot it. How much do you think he was into so far for just a shell being scuffed and shot? $50,000. $250,000. So in other words, the $50 labor rate was just... Ridiculous. Uh, they, they were charging him while they were on vacation. They were charging him while they were in the bathroom. So the only way you can get to a quarter million dollars on a paint job at 50 bucks an hour is you literally have to charge someone while you're sleeping. So, so let's just say we divide this 30,000 by $100 an hour. How many hours of labor does that give you to do a restoration? I'll make it real easy. We'll just cross off. How many hours? 300. Do we, we have 300 hours for labor. <laughs> Folks, if there is a human being in the world that can do a full restoration on a car, which is disassembling the car, stripping the car, metalworking the car, etch priming, sealing, e-coating, sanding, uh, uh, painting, clearing, cutting, buffing, upholstery, seats, wiring, gauges, uh, lights, brakes, steering, suspension, build an engine, a transmission, a differential, a transfer case, do the glass, window regulators. If there is a human being in the world that can do that in 300 hours, number one, I will hire them at any labor rate up to, uh, I'll pay them 500 bucks an hour starting today. But more than that, I will bet a million dollars that they don't exist. Because do you honestly think, you've now been around this car restoration process for a while. Do you think it is humanly possible for any human in the world to build a car in 300 hours start to finish? No. Do you, does, I mean, is, no. it, are we even, is that even in the delusional world of the twilight zone? Is it 300 hours? No. Okay, it is simply not possible. So for those people calling me up saying, why can't you build a car for 20 or $30,000? Even at 45,000, which is more than half the people offer me, that would be 11,000 in parts, and 300 hours in labor. And folks, the lowest bill we have 
ever had in a restoration for just parts alone, my cost was about $34,000. It's the lowest ever. So, and, and, and by the way, my average is now with the price of, you know, this COVID stupidity going on, uh, supply chain problems and all that, I'm averaging 40 to 60,000 just in materials. So do you now believe where before you said you would have thought that that was a lot of money mm -hmm. at 40 to 60? Today, now that you have been exposed to Phantom Works and have seen what it takes to do this, right. do you think that a 40 to $60,000 restoration truly exists? Uh, a paint job, maybe 60,000, like a good, yeah. a good paint job. A fair paint on job. On a classic, yeah. Yeah. So That's about it, no. Okay, and I'll tell you, she's still a little off there because I work with a lot of high-end shops and the general consensus is that for a truly correct restoration paint job, which is disassembly, blast, metal fab, e-coat, prime, block, seal, color, base, clear, cut, buff, and just putting all the parts back on, that starts at over $100,000. It starts at over $100,000. So then I'm bringing you a car that's not even going to be worth the amount it took to fix it to begin with. I didn't ask you to say that at all. I, in fact, I had no idea you were going to say it. She, you, couldn't be, you couldn't be more correct. Right. So, so when someone brings you a 65 Mustang, and I use that as an example, not because I don't like Ford Mustangs. Ford was the, the greatest pioneer in the automotive history ever. And, and um, I think the Mustang was the, the car that they had out of the park. Uh, look, they, they had really two winners, right? The Model T, which was the, the vehicle that set the world on fire for vehicles, and the Mustang, which is the highest production sports car ever made. So, so I, I actually, for those reasons, love the Mustang. But the fact is, is you go spend six figures on a Mustang coupe, and will you ever get your money back out of it? No. Nope. All right. So, folks, the forty to sixty thousand dollar. I don't care how many websites say it. I don't care how many people lie about the same thing. It isn't true. It can't be true. I've never. No one's ever been able to prove me wrong. So, so then it, it begs the question. So, why, why do we do this? Why do they lie? Why do they tell that lie? Oh well. Oh, okay. Well, I, I have to start getting dirty to say why, I'll give you the very quick version. If I can get you in the door and get your car taken apart and start the process, how easy is it for you to quit? It's not. It's not. So if, if I tell you it's gonna be 40, like, like the man that called me a little while ago, he found a shop that told him they'd do the full restoration for 50, and I could tell by the sound of his voice that things hadn't gone well. And I said, how far are you through the process? And he said, about 50% of the way through. I said, how much have you given him so far? He was at $300,000 and was only halfway through the process. What about the $350,000 car that just got, the, Cam the Camaro that just got sold? Yeah, I, I don't know the details on it, so I can't tell you. So look, there's a lot of anomalies in the system. But the reality is, is unless you have a providenced car, in other words, it's a rare car, highly desirable, race history, super rare options, something about it is very different. Mm -hmm. As a rule, restorations will never bring the money back. If it's a providenced car, they change all the rules, okay? It's, right. it's like the difference between owning Seabiscuit and, and, a, and a mule that, <laughs> that holds your, your hay, right? You, you get, can't get 300 bucks for the mule that hauls your hay, and Seabiscuit would be worth millions and millions in today's market. So, so there's just, just because they both trot on four legs doesn't mean they're the same horse, right. all right? So you have to look at this when you look at cars. Now, let me, I, I want you now to follow me, and we're going to go talk to Dave, because there is something in the markets today that, as a rule, not only can you make a business case for it, most clients that come in and get this done can actually make money on it. So does that make, I mean, now you've been around this world, how many cars do you think you can have built and then make money on them? Very few. The very few. So we're gonna go look at a few right now if you don't find, mind following me, Benicia. By the way, you could not hear her before. Benicia, you have to speak up. She's so quiet. Hey, Davey. All right.
So we, we lined up for you three of virtually the same build. So, so I, I'm, I'm going to invite David. I haven't prepared you really. Do me a favor. Stand there if you would. We're going to look at this car. This car just came in yesterday, right? Yep. Uh, 67. Uh, SS. May or may not be an SS 350 Camaro. It's crate 350. Yeah, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a it's a car that was recently bought at auction. But any idea how many horsepower a typical crate 350 will have? 250, 275. Believe maybe. it or not, they start out at about 180. <laughs> okay. So, so this is probably a low 200 horsepower engine, roughly. Um, the guy likes the car but it doesn't perform, it, it's not as reliable as he wants, and it certainly doesn't perform the way he wants. So, so Dave, give, give me an idea of all the systems you're gonna have to change out to put an LS in this car. All of them. No, 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 it, you're not gonna <laughs> have to change out the front valve. Uh, no, no, systems, electrical so, system, because uh, it gets, uh, you know, the, the, the control, computer controlled, EFI, all that stuff, it gets, fuel system needs to be changed, the, you know, drivetrain, we, we change all the systems right. pretty much. We touch a little bit of everything. I mean, I don't touch the paint or the cosmetics, but right. drivetrain, electrical, all that good stuff. I'm going to ask you an unfair question. Do you have to change all those systems if you put in an LS? Mm, no, not all of them. That, I, that, that's actually the correct answer. Yeah. And, and most people would say, the, the guys around here are programmed that you do have to do everything because we yeah. always do, right? Well, yeah, typically we do, but, yes. But, have we seen a fair number of LSs where they simply dropped the motor in and left everything else there? Mm -mm. No. What do you mean, have? like, left all the other systems you, in there? You can leave a 700 oh. R4 behind an LS. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can leave a 10 bolt behind an LS. Mm -hmm. you, you, can. Can, you can leave this. I wouldn't. You, I, I didn't say you should, but can you? Yeah. Can you leave the stock fuel tank behind an LS? No. Yeah, you well, can. Well, I mean, yeah, okay. Yeah, you can. The way we do it, I don't. No, I'm, I'm not, not talking about the way we do it. Right. Is it possible to pull it in an LS without putting in a new wiring harness, without yeah. putting in a good transmission, you, differential, yep. suspension? You can go that. to a junkyard and pick an LS out of any pickup truck out there and wire it in and make it work. Okay, so, so for a lot of people who say you should be able to do an LS swap for 10 grand because they're looking at a three or $4,000 yeah. high mileage used motor mm -hmm. and leaving all the rest of the old stuff in the car. Yeah. Yeah. So can you theoretically yeah. do, but you would you could, but would you ever recommend it? I wouldn't. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I, no, I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. Because do you think it will last long? No. Chris had a great saying for me and, and I've never forgotten it. A quick fix, refers more to the amount of time that it lasts than the cost or than the time it takes to fix it. So a quick fix means it's a quick fail. Okay. So, so when we do this, we're going we're gonna to rip all this out. Mm -hmm. So can we go, can, can you guys follow us? We're just going to step over here. Yeah. What is that? Oh, just dirt. Yeah. Bird poop. All right. So Davey, mm -hmm. This is in process of getting an LS. So yep. why, why am I saying a front end missing? This is ridiculous. <laughs> well, we had, a, uh, we had a couple rotted fender wells in this one. So the easiest way for these to do the fender wells is pull the front clip. Okay. Because they're, sa they're sandwiched in between a bunch of other pieces of the car. Yeah. And okay. But let me ask you this. Do you have to have good fender wells to put in an LS? No. Okay. So, so the point I'm trying to get to in this is if all you do is the minimum, You'll get away with it. Yeah. And you'll, will the cost be lower if we didn't do the fender wells? Of course. Would the job have been as good? No. Will the engine bay look as good when it's done? No. So when we opened up this car, the firewall looked horrible. The fender wells were rusted out. The body mount bushings were bad. Mm -hmm. The frame didn't look great. Yeah. So why would you, why did, before you got here, you didn't do work like this because very few shops go to this level, right? Correct. So why do you think it's now, would you now say it's necessary to do all these things? Pride. You know, I, I love, you know, just being able to, to build these cars and put a beautiful product out there. Okay. You know, that's, so, that's my view. So maybe before you wouldn't have said it was all necessary. No, well, that's the different types of shops that I've worked in too. You know, we're, they're in and out. We're fixing what's wrong with them and we're getting them back out the door, not 
you know, living with them for a few months, you know, yeah. we, we uh, you know, we did what they wanted to get done, which is specifically one thing. So we did the one thing, got it done, got it out. So. Okay. So, so is it necessary to do breaks when you put in an LS? No. Is well, it a I mean, really good idea to do is. breaks? Okay. Why? <laughs> well, more horsepower. Yeah. Okay. You so, gotta stop. Yeah. So, so look, when you take a car that had 200 horsepower and you bring it up to 500 horsepower, you better have brakes, as Donald Sutherland said in, in the, uh, uh, not the dirty, Ken and Kelly's Heroes, he goes, I'd like to think I can get out of trouble as fast as I get into it. This gets you out of trouble as fast as that gets you into it. So we, we step up everything to 13 inch rotors or larger. We go in with either electric brakes or if we have a good vacuum and everything's working good, an 11 inch booster. Don't ever install one of these little garbage <laughs> five or seven inch boosters. They don't work, they don't give you any vacuum. So we go in with a large 11 inch booster or electric brakes. Um, we, we like to match brakes and horsepower. Drivetrain, are we matching the drivetrain on this? Oh yeah. Okay, so yeah. what's in our new drivetrain? Uh, this has got a four-link setup, nine-inch housing, uh, 390 gear. This is an automatic car, so. So a what nice, transmission? Uh, we got a monster in this one. This one's got a 4L, a built 4L70, right. 4L, 4L80. Might as well make it a 4L80, but it, it's it's built to the tens. Do we do we ask our builder to build our 4Ls as cheap as they can, or with virtually the best parts that are the available. best yeah the best yeah. we are putting them behind these these screaming engines we want them to to last yeah i i don't want this car to last 20 burnouts before it before it fails yeah i want it to burn out until he's on the rims and 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 you know has to put more gas in it and the transmission's still yeah. holding on so yeah. one more let's walk over to the chevelle okay so that's an in process 68 camaro yep Now, does this one start yet? No, not yet. Okay. So no, here, I'm still missing. Oh. I still need a radiator. I need, I need a few other little odds and ends, but we're about uh, 90% done to okay. drive it. So here, I'll, I'll, I'm going to make life easier on, you know, get over there, Davey. I'm just going to, we're just going to cozy in here, buddy. All right, come on in. Here. All right. Um, so this car, how long has it been in the shop? Two and a half months, three months, maybe? About, about three months, yeah. yeah, I think that's about right. Mm -hmm. and, and was it necessary for us to redo the entire engine bay? No. Uh, no and yes, right? Well, yeah. it's not necessary because it's, it's a safety or a reliability issue. Right. But, but how many people want to lift their hood and see a 500 horsepower motor with, with chipped and flaking paint and nastiness all over it? Oh, yes, by the way, folks, there is dust on it. So yeah. Yeah. dust doesn't count. We, we no. will wipe the dust off. Yep. But we redid the firewall, redid the fender wells. In fact, this came in with plastic fender yeah, wells. Yeah, it had plastic ones on it. And, and so we, we, we had to do the same thing. We ripped this front end apart, um, redid the fender wells. Of course, it's going to get an LS compatible radiator. Yep. Um, the oil pan alone. Why, why does Chevrolet build them with oil pans that won't go into anything but into a modern Corvette? Don't ask me. I just get the pan that works yeah. with these cars. <laughs> so, so, you know, this car at this point has the right oil pan on it, the right accessories. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it's set up. Everybody wants their air conditioning. It's got heat, power steering, power brakes. So it, it's really got all the, the fixings. Mm -hmm. And this car, I won't say it's ready to go home, but it's certainly starting to get close to oh, its final. Oh, yeah, we're real close on this. Final. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to ask you a question about finances, and I'm just going to see <laughs> your thoughts. There is no right or wrong answer, right. although I'm probably going to bust your chops. Yeah, if, you will. Yeah, yeah. I will. Yeah. Um, if you own this car with a 350 in it or even a 454, mm -hmm. And you made the decision to spend the money to upgrade the brakes, to upgrade the engine bay, to upgrade the engine, the transmission, the, the steering, differential, the, yep. the steering, the suspension, new wiring. Yep. Do you think as a rule that you're going to get your money's worth for that change? Well, I, I really wouldn't think that because if I, I feel that if I put that kind of money into a car, I'm going to keep it. No, no, I'm not talking about selling it. Do you think you're right. getting your money's worth? You know oh, yeah, about what yeah. this costs. Yeah, yeah, well, especially with the reliability and knowing you just can jump in it and go for a okay. ride. Okay, so, so I, I'm going to agree. I think you're getting your money's worth. Yeah. But here's the, here's the question that people ask me all the time. 
Is it something that if I were to sell it, I'm going to get my money back out of it? Now, what are your thoughts? You know what it, now, now, and let's separate the cost of the LS from all the other repairs that we had to do mm -hmm. to the car, right? Because yeah. there's other stuff that has nothing to do with upgrading. If we had a just an LS upgrade, which is engine, right. transmission, fuel system, exhaust system, um, fuel injection, um, gauges, if we only did that and didn't have to fix 50 other things in the car, do you think you could get your money back out of your LS mod versus what it would sell before and what it would sell after? Pretty, probably pretty close. I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah, pretty close. So, so this is, and, and here's you, you got to find the right, the person, are you looking for, is, are you selling to a guy who's, who's looking for a numbers matching car or are you looking for a guy who's looking for a resto mod? How many people are looking for numbers matching cars anymore? Not really a it's whole about, lot. About one in 10. Yeah. But nine out of 10 want this one in 10 want numbers matching. And, and so here's the point I'm making. If you go out to a restoration shop and take your 65 Mustang and dump 100 grand or 200 grand or 300 grand, and yes, those are all real numbers that I've watched people do. I won't actually do those restorations, but I've seen plenty of people do. You go spend two, 300 grand on a 65 Mustang and do a numbers matching 65 coupe. What is it worth when you get done with it? 100. 90? If you're real lucky. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to lose hundreds, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands on it. If you go spend, if, if you took this Chevelle and then did an LS mod, mm -hmm. what does the LS properly done bring the value of the car up? Any idea? What, what would no. you think? No, I don't have a clue. Really? Um, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you, I, I do a lot of research on this. And if you take two cars side by side, a correctly done LS mod will generally increase the price of the car from 100 to about $150,000. So, and, and the Corvette world, that's big. You take a C2 Corvette that is a non-LS Corvette, and, and let's just say it's not a, a Providence Corvette, uh, a, a 67 coupe, um, it's gonna be, it's gonna bring 130 grand for a 67 coupe you get a 67 LS coupe that's properly done. I've seen lots of them run 250, 350, yeah. and even 450 at auction. Oh, yeah. So, so the, point, the point to this exercise where I told you, you know, is it true or is it a lie that you can get a restoration for 40 grand? I'll let you guys decide that for yourselves. If you are gonna put money into a car, you gotta think about two things your money is paying for. Number one is your emotion. This was your dad's car, uh, this was your uncle's car, this was your sister's car, your grandma's car. Was it someone special to you and is it worth your emotional equity to spend that money? The other half of the money you, you should look at, is there a residual value to the money I'm putting into it? Yeah. So, so my rule is and always has been, I take the amount of money someone wants to put into a car and I cut it in half. And I say, so for instance, if someone wants to put 100 grand into a complete LS, you know, powertrain, wiring, everything, and all the repairs on the car, I say, will the car be worth 50 grand when it's done? And if the answer is yes, it's a great project. In this case, I not only think the car is going to be worth 50 grand, I think the car is going to be worth probably every bit of 150 grand. So I think that the value of the car has gone up basically dollar for dollar of what he's spending on it. And, and so to me, yeah. if you can put money into a car and get all of that money back out of it when you get ready to sell it. It's a no brainer. It, it's, I, exactly, it's a no brainer. And you're starting to actually work on like investment mm -hmm. kind of decisions on a car rather than just purely emotional decisions on a car. Right. So. With that, um, let me ask you, are, um, I, I'm going to open it up just for one minute. Are, if there's any questions out there, are you watching, Ashley? Yeah, I'm watching. Um, <laughs> we haven't we, asked for... We actually haven't had a lot of questions, but okay. a lot more of people just really appreciating this and wanting to know more about how we're going to do, like, um, we watched Dan restore a clock. And we're, <laughs> well, we all spent three hours with him filming and restore the clock. Yeah. We're going to release it as the five minute kind of like, I'm curious, how do you restore an antique Corvette clock? And then also the deep dive. So if you're at home and you actually want to do this yourself, you've got the real guide. And then you'll also see it in the episode that we'll release 
on CMAX and on YouTube. Yeah. So that's where you want to watch things. If you're watching this on Facebook, go over to YouTube, click subscribe. So we're going to be doing a lot of these how to's coming up. The other question somebody had is, I guess just really how much of this should they be doing themselves with how crazy this is? Okay. okay. All right. So th that's a, that's a little bit more of a complex answer and one that I can't give you in, in, in even, even an hour in front of this camera. <laughs> what I can tell you is, there are things that are logical for the home or for the car owner to do, and there are things that are illogical for the car owner to do. Um, so, like, I'll just tell you at this point, Davey is so much better at LS3 mods than I am. If I wanted to do my own car, there's only one guy I'm going to go to, and that's going to be Davey, because he's better at it than I am. Um, but let me ask you, how many clocks have you rebuilt for 69 <laughs> Chevelles? Not one. Okay, so if he needs a clock built, he's going to come to me. And if we need a differential built, who are we going to? We're going to our buddy We're going Chris. to Chris. Oh, yeah. All, Every, right. all so, day. So we all have our specialties. Mm -hmm. So Davey is not the only guy that's going to touch this car. No. Chris is going to have his hands in this car. I'm going to have my hands in the car. Davey's going to have his hands in it. Rob and Colin are going to have their hands on it. Audrey's going to be doing things on the car. Everybody here has their specialty. And, and so when the question is, should I do it myself? I would say that, you know, there's a lot of things you can learn and a lot of this process you can do. Yeah. The problem for one person trying to take it all on their own is when they hit a problem, it's like a brick wall that's it's, 50 yeah, feet right. high and, and, and yeah. infinite miles wide. You're yeah. simply not getting over or around that wall. Yeah. So what I would say is if you're going to try something like this by yourself, which isn't insane, but it, it's definitely high risk, um, I, would, I would do a lot of research. Lots and, of research. Yeah, yeah and, and, <laughs> and let me just give you one segue to that. Um, I, I think we've built as many cars, classic cars, as any shop can boast on this planet. I'm not sure that anyone can claim that they've built more classics than we have. And, and at this point, I, I want to do something that's kind of fun because we get so many questions. We're going to start doing a fair number of how-to videos. And, and for some of you, it's going to, it's going to be just absolutely eye-opening of, oh my God, I had no idea that that's how you did this. For other people, they're going to go, are you serious? I thought that was difficult and it was that simple. Yeah. And, and we're going to start doing those and start releasing those. They're going to be five to 10 minutes long, but it's going to be everything from how do you fix a belt that is out of, align, uh, out of alignment, which is actually really important, mm -hmm. to how do you, if, if I were to take right now and drop a screwdriver on this fender and take a chunk out of it, is it possible to make that thing go away like it was never there? And the answer is yes, mm -hmm. I can do it. Now, if this was a metallic silver car, you ain't doing it. Nah. So, so you got to be a lot more careful around metallics than solids. We're also going to talk about and show you folks how to repair a seat, how to fix the foam in it. By the way, there's a lot of upholstery shops. You tell them to do seat covers. That foam is 50 years, under the, 50 years old. They'll leave the foam in it and put new seat covers on it. We're going to go through how to do the whole job and why to do the whole job. So, so folks, stay tuned. Um, we've just started doing some of these how-to videos. Now, Ashley, have you released the uh, clock video yet? We have not released the clock video yet. Okay, so, so I did something, and, and folks, it was, it was very fun. I love building clocks. I love building gauges, as long as they're not digital gauges and they're the old analog style. Um, so um, I've become the clock builder for the area. And uh, Ashley asked me to do one on camera, and I'll tell you, it was high risk. It was a 57 <laughs> Corvette, and the reality is only about one in three or one in four 57 Corvette clocks are even rebuildable. Most of them are simply too far gone to rebuild. But we thought we'd go ahead and try it, and, and God was smiling on me that day because not only did it completely rebuild and restore, kept perfect time, and did the whole thing in three hours. Normally, I'm in a clock six, seven hours to rebuild one. We did this clock in three hours. It came out beautifully. That video is coming out. And so the question is, should you do it yourself? You should absolutely try building your own clock. You should absolutely try doing many of these things. Mm -hmm. There's a few of them you might want to, like, you know, Dave, could you do what you do without all of the equipment and resources we have in this shop? I couldn't do half of what I do here without the team that we got here. Yeah. There's so, no way. So, you know, that's where you, you have, look, you have to be prudent and, and, and somewhat wise about making decisions, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
one of the biggest failings for people is they tear into a car and, and, and first of all, they tear it apart wrong. And that's in fact, another video we need to do is how to correctly pull apart a car, but pulling it apart isn't the hard part. It's the restoration and putting it back together. Mm -hmm. And if you pull it apart wrong, does that help you in the, in the restoration? No, no. <laughs> you're, you're up the creek without a paddle, folks. Yeah. So um, folks, stay tuned. Um, remember, when we started shooting the series called Phantom Works, we spent a year shooting before we ever released an episode. We're about three months into shooting. We haven't released a full episode yet just because it takes, you know what they say, nine women can't make a baby in one month. In fact, nine men can't make a baby in one month either, okay? So um, it still takes nine women, or one woman nine months to make one baby. And, and it still takes a certain amount of time to build a car. And, and so um, we're gonna release shorts, we're gonna be releasing podcasts, we're gonna be releasing stuff. Um, but the full episodes, they just take time. They, they gotta bake in the oven until they're done. And when they're done, we're gonna release them. So please stay tuned. Please have your friends subscribe. Folks, we no longer have the money of the, uh, the Discovery Channel behind us. Um, this is uh, me and a couple guys financing this whole thing. Um, actually, I apologize, me and a, and a man and a woman uh, financing this whole thing. Not, no, not, not just guys here and I don't wanna get in trouble <laughs> um, or things thrown at me. Um, so uh, please stay tuned and help us in any way you can. Just, just get people to subscribe and, and watch these videos. And folks, we will keep bringing you great content and we're gonna do everything we can to help you um, get over those hurdles to doing as much of it you yeah. can by yourself. Yeah, definitely. We good? Yeah, man. We good? Have a great one, folks. Yeah.